The teen accused of opening fire inside a Florida high school made his first court appearance. All 17 people who were killed have been identified. Officials say the suspect did buy the assault weapon legally at a Florida gun shop. CBS's Laura Podesta has the latest from Parkland, Florida, where residents are still trying to come to grips with this tragedy. Emotions were raw at the Pine Trails Park Amphitheater in Parkland, Florida, where a massive vigil was held overnight for those killed in Every Wednesday's day. high school massacre. <laughs> at one point, the crowd chanted in unison, no more guns. This is, makes no sense. This is impossible. My girl, my 14-year-old Baby. Earlier in the day, the suspect, 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz, was brought handcuffed into court. You are charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder. Cruz was ordered held without bond. A Broward County Sheriff's Office report says he confessed to details of the shooting. Cruz's attorneys say their client had mounting problems and fell through the cracks. He's a broken human being. He's a broken child. He is on suicide watch. Uh, the child is, is deeply troubled. Um, and he has endured significant trauma um, that stems from the loss of his mother. As more details emerge on how the attack unfolded, there are signs the loss of life, as bad as it was, could have been worse. A state senator says authorities told him it appeared Cruz tried to fire out of the school's third floor windows at students as they were fleeing. Thankfully, though, the windows made of safety glass did not shatter. Laura Podesta, CBS News, Parkland, Florida. Police have interviewed more than 2,000 people so far in this investigation. The school is still a crime scene and will remain closed today. Also new this morning, four proposed immigration bills in the Senate all failed yesterday. That leaves the fate of Dreamers in jeopardy. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says the fault lies with Democrats, saying they are not serious about finding a path to citizenship for hundreds of thousands of Dreamers. But many Republicans also voted against President Trump's bill that would have given Dreamers citizenship in exchange for billions to build a border wall. In one of the most intense flu seasons in recent history, figures released yesterday show the flu vaccine is only 36% effective in preventing severe illness. Only once this decade has the vaccine been so ineffective. The Yellowstone County Coroner's Office has identified the man who was found dead near a Billings business earlier this week. 55-year-old Steve Allgaard of Billings was found dead in a sleeping bag Tuesday morning in some bushes along South 24th Street West. Billings police reported Allgaard may have been camping in the area and suspect he may have died from exposure. Deputy County Coroner Richard Hoffman says while exposure might have been a factor, he can't declare a specific cause of death until he sees a toxicology report. Those tests usually take up to eight weeks to process. Republican Senate candidate Troy Downing appeared in a Bozeman courtroom this week to answer to a series of alleged hunting violations. From 2011 to 2016, Downing was cited seven times by Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks for buying or applying to buy a resident hunting and fishing license when he wasn't living in Montana. In all, he faces nine misdemeanors, including the alleged illegal transfer of a license to his son. While Downing calls Big Sky his primary residence, he's originally from California and still owns multiple properties there. Downing is one of four Republican hopefuls vying for the GOP nomination to challenge Democratic Senator John Tester this coming fall. His trial is scheduled to take place weeks before Montana's June 5th primary election. Another of Senator Tester's opponents was in Washington, D.C. this week to pitch his campaign to the White House political director. On Wednesday, former Billings District Judge Russ Fagg met with White House officials to talk about Montana. Fagg says much of his conversation revolved around how he believes he's the best choice for Montana. He also says the main focus of his campaign is to bring the state to the forefront. Bag told Q2 his main reason for running is because he believes Senator Chester is out of touch with the state. Bag also says 80% of his fundraising has come from Montanans and that shows how much support he's garnered in state. Anyone who runs for Congress must publicly disclose their personal wealth and financial holdings. So MTN's chief political reporter Mike Dennison took a closer look and it turns out the list of candidates running for Montana's U.S. Senate and House seats includes some very wealthy people. 
In Montana's U.S. Senate race, at least three of the four Republicans hoping to unseat Democrat John Tester are multimillionaires. The state auditor Matt Rosendale, a former real estate developer, reports holdings worth anywhere from $7 million to $32 million, including his ranch property near Glendive. The disclosure forms require the candidates to report the value of their holdings within a range, rather than precisely. Big Sky businessman Troy Downing, who sold a tech company to Yahoo and now has a self-storage business, reported holdings worth between $3.5 million and $7.5 million. That doesn't include an undeveloped lot in the exclusive Yellowstone Club, valued by the state revenue department at about $2 million. And former state district judge Russell Fagg of Billings lists family holdings between $6 million and $27 million, not including a valuable office building held by his family that he would eventually inherit. Republican Senate candidate Al Oshevsky, a surgeon from Kalispell, hasn't filed his disclosure form. As for Senator Tester, he reports the value of his holdings as between $1.6 million and $6.2 million, most of which is in his big sandy farm. On the House side, no one can touch Republican Congressman Greg Gianforte when it comes to personal wealth. He has various investment holdings worth at least $200 million and a family charitable trust worth another $150 million. Some reports list him as the wealthiest person in the entire Congress, House, and Senate. Gianforte made his money with Right Now Technologies, a software development firm he founded with his wife Susan in Bozeman. It was sold to Oracle in 2012 for $1.8 billion. Five Democrats are competing for the nomination to take on Gianforte. Among them, the wealthiest is John Heenan, a Billings attorney with reported holdings worth $3 million to $11 million. Heenan has won some big civil judgments, representing homeowners suing banks. Two of the other Democrats, former Land Trust Director Grant Keir of Missoula and former State Representative Kathleen Williams of Bozeman, report modest investment and property holdings worth less than $1 million each. Democrat Jared Pedinato of Bozeman has some property holdings worth as much as $1.6 million, and former State Senator Linda Moss hasn't filed her report yet. So, is politics just a rich man's or women's game? Not always. But for Montana candidates this year, it appears being extremely wealthy is more common than not. Mike Dennison, MTN News, Helena. In other news, every year Billings Police Chaplains honor law enforcement officers at the Police Appreciation Banquet. But on Thursday night, in a bit of a twist, a retiring chaplain also took center stage. Chaplain Paul Reeder helped start the chaplain program on February 2nd, 1978. The 87-year-old Reeder has been a chaplain for 40 years and still attends daily police briefings. Thursday night, many notes and letters of thanks and respect were read aloud. An audio message were played expressing gratitude for Reader's service. Billings Police Chief Rich St. John called Reader a stately and seasoned man of cloth. Reader uses humor but also knows a serious side to help officers get through issues. The operative word is through, and we go through things. Uh, but, you know, God doesn't leave us in the midst of the mess. He brings us through it in one way or another. Somehow along with people who can help and support, we get through things. Chaplain Reeder says he plans to retire at the end of the month, but he has one project to complete, so that might take a little longer. Before we take a break, Montana is known for producing Olympians in sports like skiing. But 50 years ago, the state made its mark in sliding sports as well. MTN's Jonathan Imbarian looks at how Lolo Hot Springs became the first hub for luge in the U.S. Ellen Henry first heard about luge in 1964 as a high schooler watching the Olympics with her father. It looked kind of interesting, but other than that, I didn't know the, what it was like. Jim Murray remembers watching newsreel footage of bobsled races as a boy. That memory stuck with him years later when he was a student at the University of Montana and saw a flyer for a new luge club being formed. I just happened to read the first sentence and it says luge similar to bobsled. That's what started it all. Both Henry and Murray became members of that UM luge club. Within four years, they would go from novices to U.S. Olympic athletes. It's a journey that started at Lolo Hot Springs in the mountains west of Missoula. After Luge made its Olympic debut in 1964, Montana businessmen came up with the idea of creating a track of their own at the resort. It would become the first Luge track in the U.S. None of these guys knew how to build a track or anything about it. They just saw one and figured, well, we can do that. 
When students traveled to Lolo to practice, they found there was still a lot of work to do. We're out there with a shovel and a hose and it's cold and making slush and, well, this looks about right. The area behind me might look like a typical trail, but managers at Lolo Hot Springs believe this is the location of the original luge run. More than 50 years ago, you could have seen the sliders of the UM Luge Club honing their skills right here. Running down the Lolo track was a unique experience. I remember going down it, rattling around, then kind of jumped the track and went on the pedestrian track and jumped back in and I won. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. The people who built the Lolo Run hoped to host championships until warm weather made it too difficult to maintain. But the students who learned the sport there were starting to gain attention. When the U.S. luge team for the 1968 Olympics in Grenoble, France was chosen, four Lolo sliders made the cut, including Murray and all three female competitors, Henry, then known as Ellen Williams, UM student Sheila Johansson, and Miles City High Schooler Kathleen Roberts. The team's coach and manager also came from Montana. After their runs on the Olympic track, the Lolo racers finished in the middle of the pack, but they say they had plenty to be proud of. We all finished and we were all good sports and that's what they were looking for. Murray went on to compete for the U.S. at the 1972 and 1976 Olympics, then serve as a team manager in 1980. So it's been a good run. Henry didn't try for another Olympics. Today she lives outside Clinton, Montana. She still has the sled she used in the games. I am so lucky and so blessed to have been able to do that. There isn't much left at Lolo Hot Springs to remind visitors of its place in winter sports history. Much of the old luge track is now part of the resort's disc golf course. But the people who learned the sport there are proud of what they accomplished. For lack of a better term, we laid the foundation for what they have today. Jonathan Amberian, MTN News, Lolo Hot Springs.